countries who call for energy, um, which is energy comes from resources which all of us own in common, natural resources given to us by the earth, whether they come from under the earth, whether they are fossil fuels or whether they are sun, light, air, sea. And they come to all of us as a right, not just as something to be exploited for the gain of a few, um, which is what was happening and still happens today in a lot of global south countries where goods and natural resources are extracted and used in the developed world. Uh, while the developing countries from which that coal comes from, for example, Colombian coal, um, often is extracted at the cost of local communities and used uh, in the global north. But the benefits, again, are, are not seen at, at that local level. So he spoke about the oil crisis, that these resource dependent countries, uh, the president of Mexico spoke about this. Um, these resource dependent countries could not access uh, wealth at a more international level. So um, I worked with uh, the National Economic and Social Council and I developed four case studies on just transition. And uh, my job was to look at how these countries engage in a just transition approach, uh, moving away from resource fossil fuel, um, primarily coal dependent societies into new economies. Now, unfortunately, it's quite a, a, a new area that there aren't actually many examples, if any, uh, potentially only Germany, of where countries have actually transitioned justly to a new economy. Um, however, so it's quite a new area, very exciting. Um, but just to keep that in mind, uh, the, pro the project itself um, was developed um, as part of NESC's programme looking at automate, uh, looking at digital and uh, low carbon economy uh, transitions. Um, and I focus on these case studies of fossil fuels. So the 11 lessons that we have, uh, I did have lovely photographs which aren't coming up here, but um, just to discuss the different lessons, I suppose firstly, Transitions are very, very complex and take an awful lot of time. Uh, that seems quite obvious, but it is actually interesting how people think that you can kind of have, have a cookie cutter approach where you can apply a transition in one country to a new one uh, very, very quickly. Uh, speaking to the START program, um, Robert Pollock, a lovely man that's working with the start program at EU level to um, help countries to just transition across the EU. Uh, he himself has said, what many interviewees have said, is that um, you really have to be very, very place folks focused and listen to a region, their past experience of transition, respect, take a very humble approach uh, to the local community and what their needs are, rather than applying what you think might work best, that sort of, um, uh, an approach that says that transition worked really well in this country, so will work fine here. That doesn't play out at all. You have to be very region specific. Um, also, preparation is key. And um, in all the transition kind of case studies I looked at, either transition had been done in advance, uh, preparations had been done in advance by government in the case of Germany, and um, it had been done regionally by trade unions uh, and local groups together, which is what happened in Australia. Uh, there was a 45 day fire in a coal mine and the local community um, prepared a citizen science initiative showing that coal mining was damaging the local workers and the local community. Um, and they worked with the local trade union to build alternatives for the region and, and also the nurses union as well, uh, because the public health impacts of the coal mining. And they developed a program that then was taken up by the Labour government uh, with a 266 million uh, initial package. Um, so that was a very positive example. Um, in the case of Germany, uh, it took 60 years, their transition, uh, 60 years of back and forth, but they were benefited from very, very strong social partnerships, social dialogue, employee co-determination on boards. Um, and that kind of working, that atmosphere of working together in the rural valley, uh, workers, trade unions, the community, not so much the community, but certainly and um, very strong local government, very strong local unions and, and businesses working with people uh, that prepared them very, very well for the transition. Um, so just one example, I'm glad the photos for this are working, is uh, Scotland. Uh, this is an example of where past transitions very much inform the current transition. So uh, Scotland has a long history of uh, not having complete ownership of its oil and gas reserves off the coast. 
and um, they're owned and, and directed mainly by Westminster. And this actually is where a lot of the SNP's vote comes from people who say it's Scotland's oil, it should be our oil. Uh, and now as the oil uh, industry and the gas industry are facing a downturn since 2014, automation of jobs in particular, um, but also a general downturn because the price of oil is dropping dramatically. Uh, there's huge job losses in Aberdeen. Um, and now as they move into renewables, what's happened is that the renewable industry, similar to oil and gas, has been privatised and it is now um, it, the, the local jobs are not being gotten by the people who maybe worked on the oil and gas rigs, even though Skills Development Scotland have shown that there's a very much a link between the two types of jobs, that they're very transferable. Um, however, people are not getting those jobs on the ground. Uh, and the same transition is kind of repeating itself. And that frames the current language in Scotland. Uh, so other lessons, personnel. This is something I think that often gets lost in discussions of just transition is that um, there's kind of, uh, obviously uh, there are kind of wider issues with ju social justice in society and carbon mitigation kind of choices. So carbon mitigation is when a state says, okay, we have to cut emissions in this manner. And generally, uh, generally speaking, what tends to happen is that a market-based approach is taken. So um, uh, that's like kind of carbon taxes or consumer-based taxes uh, and also emissions trading kind of schemes. And while there's evidence that that can work in certain respects, um, if other kind of more uh, wider public investment decisions are not taken along with that. So, for example, choosing electric vehicles, but not also encouraging uh, further investment in public transport, what you get is that you have people um, who are poor being left behind, who can't access those more expensive um, climate action proposals if it is very individualistic based. Uh, another example is, say, raising carbon taxes in order to encourage people to retrofit homes but not perhaps understanding that people do not have the money um, to retrofit their homes upfront in order to avoid carbon taxes. Uh, so that's kind of a, that has become part of a just transition discussion. However, the history of just transition comes from the trade union movement. And while those discussions are very, very important, uh, I fear that there might be a bit of an issue where um, Kind of workers' rights issues, which are alive, for example, in the Midlands, and um, access to redundancies, access to redeployment if a company is moving into a new area. Uh, those personnel restru restructuring processes are very, very strong in countries like Germany, where the, their coal exit commission started in 2018 and um, very much took the approach that these workers who are working in the industry today and their families, their sons and daughters, and so on should be afforded opportunities in these companies as they move into renewables or they move into clean industry. Um, and that kind of internal retraining, uh, redeployment, early retirement, very good um, kind of retraining packages, being allowed days off work to retrain, uh, that has been brokered by government in each of the case studies, um, apart from maybe Scotland, which is taking more of a uh, kind of, uh, they have a task force, but there's a bit of a clash with um, maybe more of a market-led approach. Um, now, obviously, a balance has to be struck, has to be struck between a phase-out. Um, so you get this conflict between a company that wants to obviously make a profit and continue making that profit. You have a trade union and workers who want a long phase-out as long as possible. And then you have an environment that has been steadily degraded and um, impacting the public health of the local people but also impacting on the climate as well. So that's a difficult balance. Um, and some countries have taken a, a social dialogue approach to that either setting up a just transition commission, setting up a coal, as in Scotland, um, or just transition, uh, sorry, a coal exit commission, as in Germany, um, to deal with uh, the uh, louts, which, and other countries with, where brown coal is taken. Um, so, but the workers' rights aspect has to be strong, uh, and I fear maybe in the Irish context, it, it's not as strong. Uh, it's kind of taken as a general fairness, um, which doesn't really build the, the respect in the local community. Um, other, again, I've spoken about social justice, sorry, social dialogue. 
Uh, new institutional structures can be very good. However, they do have to be rooted in things that um, measure, can be measured to change people's local circumstances. Um, constant talks or constant dialogue circles or um, kind of town hall meetings can wear people out and um, tend to kind of just cause um, uh, like distrust in the local community. And this is all about trust building. Um, what is trust? How do you build trust? Uh, those are kind of, I suppose, very normative. Have to take a couple of steps back to discuss, but um, it is about trust fundamentally. These are often regions that have experienced a very damaging transition previously. Uh, in, in, the, in the example of the Louts, which I give this photo here, uh, where you have local um, environmental activists trying to shut down coal mines, uh, the local community there, um, not local, but I suppose the region is in East Germany. And in uh, 1989, 90% of the workforce lost their jobs uh, with um, uh, uh, in entering with, with the combination of, of West and East Germany coming together. And the fall of the Berlin Wall left uh, huge uh, job losses. And also the brown coal mining is open strip mining. So it requires the leveling of whole villages and towns in order to continue. Um, so there's a big lack of uh, very kind of tense circumstances, a lack of a lack, lack of trust between not only the local people and the company, but also um, the, the trade unions and kind of new forms of, uh, of business operations. So it needs to be very place based, very in inclusive. Um, and also the positives is that what's sometimes overlooked is that these areas, uh, they have long histories of coal mining. Um, or of um, fossil fuel, engaging with a fossil fuel, and they often are best placed to know how to uh, reduce emissions. They themselves know how to rehabilitate a bog, they themselves might know how to stop drainage, they themselves might know how to, um, to benefit the area in, ter in terms of tourism, what, what the history of the area is that would be very interesting for new people, and they themselves are often best placed to sustainably develop a region so a very top-down approach that kind of sees people as, as victims or sees people as um, kind of uneducated workers that don't have uh, skills to offer um, is entirely untrue. Uh, these are often the best case people with uh, incredible skills, but often those skills are not in, um, are not kind of acknowledged in um, kind of uh, our standard kind of university programs or uh, technological institute programs, so certificates and so on can be very, very helpful and have been found helpful in Hazelwood in Australia, for example. Um, also, however, um, skills audits and so on, uncovering and valuing skills um, are useful, but they must be backed up by massive state investment. And like, for example, in, in Germany, um, they have a 40 billion package uh, being put together for former coal mining regions in order to phase out coal mining by 2038. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt oh, you there, but you're going to have to wrap up soon. Sorry. We're just yeah, no, that's perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, um, so, um, yeah, that's my last slide. You can't see the photo, but <laughs> um, I just wanted to say finally that, yeah, the transitions are very complex. Uh, people have experienced previous comes transitions an awful lot of trauma often comes with that and you need to rebuild trust. So um, yeah, just transition is about where are we going uh, before we decide to go there. So yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for that, um, that was a lovely presentation and I'm sure our next speaker would like to carry on this discussion. So I'd like to call on John Barry to contribute to this topic next. John, if you're okay to start. Yeah, that's great. Thank you and good afternoon everybody and thank you to Forza for the invitation. If I could just pick up from where Sinead left off, we have to understand the just transition as not about greening or a low carbon version of carbon based consumer growth orientated capitalism. So there's my big statement is that this is a decision and a strategy and a policy to be to live and to work and to strive and to struggle for a different type of society and economy. It is not a reformist uh, perspective. I'm going to focus most of my comments around uh, the issue of the pandemic and the inevitable um, depression. I think we're not looking at a recession coming out of this. It's going to be a depression and how we can see 
that there absolutely has to be a green and just recovery. So in many respects, the just transition, which a year ago we could have just talked about the just transition, I think increasingly we need to talk about a just recovery, a just and inclusive green recovery. And I'll begin for, uh, for brevity with five statements just to get you thinking and to provoke some uh, perhaps reaction. The first one is the pandemic has canceled the future, but that's okay because of the shit one anyway. Um, second is we should return or so we should resist any desire to return to normal. Normal was a problem. Normal was gender unequal, uh, ecocidal, uh, inequality producing, uh, gig economy, precarious work. Why in the name of God would we want to go back to normal? So we must resist this, this desire in some respects that you can see is, you know, kind of common sense to return to normal. And in any green recovery, which is also how I'm understanding the just transition, it should be focused resolutely on jobs, not growth. Uh, and that should be really important for Ireland, given we've seen the phenomenon of uh, jobless growth or what Paul Krugman, Nobel Prize winning economist called leprechaun economics, given the way that multinationals can wash their profits to Ireland. And so it shows up on our uh, economic growth statistics, but not a screed of jobs coming out of it. So we need jobs, not growth, as we come out of this pandemic. The other issue is that, and Sinead in a way hinted at this, it is inevitable, folks, it is inevitable that we have to make a transition to a low carbon climate resilient economy. Otherwise, there won't be a habitable planet to live on. There are no jobs on a dead planet after all. But the issue here, while it's inevitable, we have to make this transition to a low carbon and climate resilient economy, whether or not it is just or not is not inevitable. And that's where politics and struggle and strategy will have to come in. So I go even beyond what Sinead was describing in terms of social dialogue, which is an essential part of the just transition as a policy framework and more into the realms of youth strike for climate, extinction rebellion, and those social mobilizations for climate justice. We will have to engage in my view um, in nonviolent civil disobedience and direct action and not simply uh, depend upon the normal processes of government. In part because when I speak now as a recovering politician, is that the political system isn't broke, it was made that way. It's simply not up to the task of this most unusual existential crisis that we face. Therefore, we need to move beyond politics as normal and the reformist default position of a lot of citizens and indeed most political parties. And the last thing I'd say is that my view, based on my experience of over 30 years now as an academic researching this, is that a sustainable future is one that is post-carbon. We've got to move away from coal, oil and gas as quickly as we can. And indeed, we have to move away from coal, oil and gas quicker than they're going to uh, de you know, decline in terms of these being non-renewable resources. But actually, the real issue here is we also need to have a post-growth move beyond this fetishization, this focus on competitiveness, foreign direct investment, GDP growth, which often is, has a very weak link with jobs and employment and indeed public services and so on. So we need post-carbon, post-growth, and I would also say post-capitalist, that I cannot see a viable, sustainable economy that exists within the parameters of a capitalist system that is based upon accumulation and growth every year, as well as providing uh, less and less advantages Picking to the most vulnerable in society. In specific, in relation to Ireland, you know, Sinead has very eloquently pointed out in other parts of the world, Germany, you can look at Poland and so on, very coal based, and where you can see the just transition and, and, and how do you compensate retrain workers. The nearest equivalent we've had in Ireland is a very unjust transition in the Irish Midlands uh, of what happened uh, with the Borden Amona workers. Uh, who weren't included in any social dialogue in terms of the decision to end uh, uh, peat cutting. Don't get me wrong, I think the right decision was not to continue in cutting peat on an unsustainable basis, but there was no social dialogue. And I think it's it's got Ireland off to a very bad start in terms of you know uh, encouraging workers and trade unions in particular to get behind the idea of a just transition. So it's brilliant that FORSA is having this debate here today, and I hope that work in terms of percolating out to the wider trade union family that the trade unions really should be setting the agenda for a just transition 
Because as again, as Sinead pointed out, the origins of the just transition lie in the trade union movement. And therefore, it needs to be on the front foot in terms of dictating and determining uh, the agenda on this particular issue. But in Ireland, we don't have the same scale beyond, as I said, the Borden Amona issue. In Ireland, I think the just transition is going to be particularly important in our rural communities, given the high proportion of our greenhouse gases that come from particularly uh, an over uh, beef dependent agricultural sector. And this should be alongside and with our farming communities and not dictating to them. So that's part of social dialogue is that farmers aren't stupid. They can see the climate is changing, that there is a very heavy carbon footprint for industrial types of, of farming. So we need to create that social dialogue with our farming communities to come up with, you know, whether it's uh, organic, uh, agroecological, there are a range of options in terms of the transition of our food system. But we also need to include not just the producers and the communities directly impacted by the divestment that Sinead pointed out of moving away from these heavy carbon or greenhouse gas emitting sectors. We also have to have to protect consumers. In other words, households, particularly on low income, should not be disproportionately impacted as we make this transition to a low carbon economy. And therefore, issues like a carbon tax, which to remind you, as most of you probably know, is in the programme for government, I think is deeply worrying because of the reg regressive impacts that will have on uh, you know, low income families. So we need to protect households in terms of making sure they're not disproportionately impacted. And indeed, we need to return to better as we come out of this pandemic, just to begin to, to wind up. We need to see that tackling the climate emergency and the planetary emergency, because we also have a, an ecological crisis, should be seen as an opportunity to create non-outsourceable green energy, indigenous energy, and good, decent, well-paid, unionized jobs in that. To see that there's a whole range of work that's needed to be done in the restoration of our degraded ecosystems. And indeed, we need to begin to see that part of the, the narrative of a, of a just transition and a green recovery should be around building back better, which perhaps some of you have you know, seen. It's doing a lot of the rounds on social media in terms of people thinking about the, uh, the pandemic. And a lovely phrase I've come across from the, is a, a Scottish novelist called Alistair Gray, and he describes it very well. He said, we should be seeing what we're facing now and the work that needs to be done as if we're working in the early days of building a better society. There should be an excitement that what we're engaged in now, folks, is a new industrial revolution. We're on the cusp of a, of a different economic paradigm that has to be green, but we really have to struggle. And I mean, political struggle in terms of making sure that this is inclusive of all communities, workers, and indeed our, our consumers. So to finish, the issue here is in a just recovery and a just transition. We need to also see that in, the, in reference to the last major economic crisis we had in 2007, 2008, we now know in the context of this current crisis, austerity was a lie, and therefore any eco-austerity should be resisted as the price we pay for any low carbon transition. We now discover certainly in governments that have a, a sovereign currency like the UK, there is a magic money tree. Money is available whenever it's uh, you know required, as the UK Chancellor has said. Just as an aside, have you ever wondered what it's always money for war and not for education or healthcare? The issue is not the fiscal constraints on the state. It's a political choice that governments make in terms of whether or not to use their fiscal powers that they have. The pandemic has shown us that states and populations can move quickly and that indeed, if it is an emergency and the doll has declared a climate and ecological emergency, the Northern Ireland Assembly up here where I live has also declared, many county councils across the land have declared. But how would you as a citizen, how would you know that you're living in a jurisdiction that has declared a climate and ecological emergency? The pandemic shows us what an emergency looks like. Immediate action led by the state Populations being communicated to clearly. And one thing I would say we can learn from the pandemic is how can you communicate this issue? So we're all familiar at the start of the pandemic of that idea of flattening the curve. So we have to spread out the, the you know, the, the spike in the number of COVID cases so the healthcare systems weren't overrun. Unfortunately, we took our eye off care homes. That's a, a, a separate issue. But why not have that same messaging in terms of the climate crisis of bending the curve down? And the curve here is greenhouse gas emissions. 
to communicate the population that was, that's what's needed to be done. We now know that the pandemic has made possible, perhaps, that we can think of perhaps the end of this, the radical transformation of capitalism, the end of capitalism rather than the end of the world. So for me, while we are in a deeply you know, uh, serious situation, I think a crisis like any crisis creates great opportunities to do things differently. So again, the pandemic has canceled the future, but that's okay. It was a shit one anyway. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, John. Um, I just want to say before we move on to our next speaker, we have a stream of questions coming in for the panel. So um, if, if the time permits, we will get to that. But just quickly, we'll move on to our, our next speaker for the day, Nal Shanahan, who is Forces Communications Officer. And Nal is going to be speaking on the automation part of the session. Uh, thank you, Mayhak. Um... And uh, thank you, John and Sinead, uh, for those uh, really interesting contributions. Uh, as Mayhak says, I'm going to look at the issue of automation. And as I'm the son of a bus driver, I'd like to open with a story about a bus driver. Uh, a fellow named Andrew Worth, he addressed uh, the UK's uh, Trade Union Congress in November 2018. And he told delegates that autonomous vehicles would mean his, his role as a bus driver would, in effect, be over. He said, I wouldn't have ultimate control of the vehicle. Instead, I'd be there as emergency stop button pusher. Do you think my company would pay me the same rate of pay? Of course not. So Andrew's observations reflect an anxiety that most of us probably share about uh, automation to greater or lesser degrees. So quite aside from any anxiety that we might lose our job to a robot, there's that underlying anxiety that many of us have about technology that's driven by our knowledge that private companies are hungrily gathering and using our personal data. The machines are hungry for data and we are constantly feeding those machines, but is it a relationship of mutual trust? There are things that we're willing to let machines do uh, to suggest music and movies based on our preferences, even to suggest friends or desirable dates and suitable jobs. Do we value these suggestions over those of, say, our friends and colleagues, or do we recognise them as being merely another channel through which these suggestions come to us? There are things that we won't yet allow machines to do for us, at least not yet. For example, who will buy a ticket to fly in an aeroplane with no pilot? The consumer market for that type of technology doesn't yet exist, but the technology itself already does. So if we think about technology as a disruptor, there is a, a widespread agreement that contemporary innovations and developments in automation, computing, robotics, and artificial intelligence, or AI, poses at least the possibility of disruption and changes uh, to markets and employment. And these developments have caused some anxiety among unions and those of us interested in labor markets as the prospect of mass unemployment precipitated by automation and computerization seems evident. But this is by no means a new challenge for the trade union movement. Um, let's go back to 1956 to Trade Union Congress again. And the hot topic in 1956 at the TUC, uh, people were talking about a new electronic computer developed by the food manufacturer Lions. And the, the computer was known as Leo, the Lions Electronic Office, and it could work out the pay slips for 10,000 employees in four hours. Now, that was a job that had previously kept 37 clerks busy at Lions. And the TUC's message around these developments actually echoed the optimism of the economist John Maynard Keynes and his belief that this is the kind of technology that could usher us forth toward a more prosperous, leisure-based society. So the TUC said automation offers the prospect of higher pay, greater leisure and healthier and less strenuous work. But the TUC also argued that unions would need to make sure the benefits of greater productivity were shared with workers. So in that latter sense, our concerns today remain much as they were in 1956. But the challenge in front of us, given the rapid developments in technology, is probably far greater. Let's consider, and certainly from a force of perspective, the human touch. We know that uh, machine learning has enabled computers to develop their own solutions to problems rather than relying on explicitly programmed responses. And this potentially increases the scale of labor placement very significantly. But what about the intuitive human touch? 
non-routine tasks and occupations that tend to be based on tacit understanding and situational judgment cannot be easily codified for computers to carry out. Uh, this is where the poly pol Polanyi paradox, it's a difficult word to say, Polanyi paradox, states that humans know more than they know they know. And this certainly applies in terms of the day-to-day decision-making for our members working in public services. So if we look at the grades that FORSA represents, like social workers, social care workers, as well as, say, nurses, guardi, paramedics, anyone else in public-facing services, they're required to make judgments that require empathy and ability to read people and to make an assessment of the best thing to do in, in a given situation. If we look at uh, studies and employment trends, um, academic studies since the turn of the millennium actually vary quite a bit on the extent to which whole jobs, as distinct from specific tasks, will be eliminated by evolving technology. Uh, in 2018, Nedel Koska and Quintini uh, published a study that estimated that approximately half of jobs have a high likelihood of at least being affected by automation. And of that number, 14% uh, are highly automatable, with a probability of automation of greater than 70%. Additionally, uh, Nedel Koska and Quintini say that about a third of jobs have a risk of automation of between 50 and 70%. Uh, pointed at the possibility of significant change in the way those jobs are carried out. And while the academics dispute the extent of the risk of automation to uh, labour markets, they do tend to agree on trends, including the inverse relationship between uh, educational level and risk of automation. So as recently as 2018, the OECD said that this particular trend is already reflected in employment outcomes. So that means workers with lower levels of education are the most at risk uh, of automation and the unemployment rate is already starting to reflect this in OECD countries. Uh, in Ireland, Doyle and Jacobs produced a study in 2018 It found that approximately two out of five jobs, that's 40% in Ireland, are likely to be substantially impacted by automation. And they cited transportation and storage, agriculture, forestry and fishing and construction, all carrying a probability of automation greater than 50 percent. So in a small open economy, which is what we're told we, we, we have, uh, that's a very significant figure. And they also found that women tend to be employed in occupations with a higher risk of automation than men. So automation is likely to exacerbate existing pay inequality between men and women. Now, it was, it was really interesting to note that uh, both John and Sinead mentioned uh, the importance of uh, social dialogue. And I'm going to refer to that too. I mean, the most common response by unions across Europe to the advancing tide of change that's anticipated is greater dialogue, cooperation and consultation when introducing new technology to the workplace. So those three elements, greater dialogue, cooperation and consultation, they're actually the oldest and most reliable tools that trade unions have to deal with the onset of change. And they're the most efficient tools, I think, for what lies ahead. So trade unions have made it their goal to ensure that the benefits of automation and technological development lead to better working lives. When FORSA led on the campaign last year for a four day working week, we were slightly taken aback by the enthusiasm expressed by employers and their representatives. But employers recognised the productivity potential of a four day week and some employers have already taken the first steps into this new working week with quite promising results. So let's imagine that this were to come to pass more universally. It would dramatically alter road traffic flow between our suburbs, towns and cities, which is currently unsustainable, both for our environment and our mental and physical health. If we included a shift of emphasis to more remote working options, including working from home, the environmental dividend is at least potentially greater still. So is the four day week an idea whose time has come? The, uh, the COVID-19 lockdown experience has proved to be a, an unexpected uh, disruptor of the conventions of work for many of us. Maybe it's a gateway into another world of work, a world where a four day working week actually proves necessary as well as beneficial. Uh, FORSA set out a position to the civil service last year to the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, uh, which stated that FORSA would support properly thought out automation controlled by workers whose aim will be 
the continued enhancement and delivery of public services. And what we wouldn't countenance, couldn't countenance, is the diminution of workplaces through the march of automation for automation's sake. So our position as well highlights the importance of training and skill development. We praise developments like the retraining of staff at the revenue commissioners, for example, because it allowed that office to best deliver on their goal rather than reducing jobs. So if we look wider, of what trade unions are doing in the story so far. Uh, trade unions have called for greater dialogue when introducing new technology to the workplace. They've made it their goal to ensure that the benefits of automation lead to better working lives for their members. Uh, Forza has highlighted the importance of training and skill development. Uh, we believe the improvement uh, of a work-life balance should be a prime focus, something that the COVID working from home experience has focused us all to think a great deal more about. Uh, we believe that technological improvements should not be an excuse for outsourcing in the workplace. Uh, the UK Public Service Union, Unison, has developed an official's guide for bargaining over automation. And the German Public Services Union um, have built this into their annual activity. They organise annual conferences on digitisation and the future of work. So some of the examples I've drawn on today uh, come from a report uh, by Craig Whelan. Craig is an analyst with the Competition and Consumer Protection Commission. He's also a FORSA member, and he spent a few months with us last year as part of his UCD Masters on Public Policy uh, Programme, developing a scoping report on how new technologies could affect FORSA and its members. So Craig's report, which we will make available to you today uh, after this session, concludes with the following recommendations. He says, further research is needed to fully estimate and quantify how many FORSA members are at risk of automation, job displacement and disruption. And that follows, I think, for all trade unions, that we should be proactive in seeking agreements with employers on automation and ensure that this process is worker led and that we should take the lead in the automation debate in Ireland and develop a policy campaign taking inspiration from other European unions significantly. And I think this is probably the most important point. Uh, Craig recommends that these issues should not be considered separate to core union business. They should be at the core of union business. And echoing John's point about uh, dealing with uh, uh, the climate challenge, it needs to be embedded into all our discussions on policy. It needs to be woven into the fabric of social dialogue, of government policy, and into every decision that we make, because these two issues cast a very long shadow on both the world of work, the economy and society generally. So that concludes my contribution and thanks for listening. Thanks so much for that, Niall. Um, and I just, it's so interesting to hear about the trends in automation and how just how important it is to manage these transitions well moving forward. Um, so I'd now like to invite our last speaker of the day, Mary Murphy, who is going to wrap up the session. Mary, if you'd like to start. I'm afraid we can't hear you yet, Mary. You'll have to unmute. Thanks, Mary. Can you hear me now? Okay, maybe I'll not bother using my PowerPoints. Um, yeah, look, I don't know where to start now. What I had prepared, it's just been so interesting listening to people. Um, but I think just taking out some common themes as starting points for what I want to talk about. Niall talked about the power of private companies. Um, and that, that wants to be my starting point. He talked about Polanyi as well. And I, I actually am going to slide share. If that's OK. Can you see my slides? No. Um, no, yeah, yeah. See them now. Thanks, Mary. Great. Thank you. OK, what I want to do is I do want to, to follow on from what Niall said in talking about Kalani. Sinead said, you know, before we can ask, we need to know where we're going before we can decide how to get there. And I think that chimes in very nicely with, with um, that comment from Alistair Gray that John introduced about where we want to what, 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 where we want to go is to actually build a new society um, and 
Charles Sable at an S conference a while ago talked about that the level of uncertainty that we have in the world, not just in relation to the pandemic, because this was said way before the pandemic, is we used to talk about look before you leap, but now the approach is to look as you leap. So the kind of institutions, the kind of knowledge we need to bring in, the kind of processes that we need to make our decisions through are completely different in the context of the level of uncertainty that we're living in. And the pandemic has offered us some examples in that regard. And I want to try and draw on what the pandemic might be teaching us about automation, digitalization and inequality. And then also where it points towards in maybe thinking about what kind of reforms can support the new world of work that we might be looking into. So I particularly want to look at what welfare architecture do workers need? And more importantly, I think, does society need, do people need in order to be able to cope with the level of uncertainty, the level of change and the level of risk taking that they're going to have to take to enable this change to happen for good or for bad. Some of it being inevitable and some of it being our choice as to how we share the risk burden of how some of that inevitable change happens. And I want to end by just talking about what we need is we've talked about social dialogue, we've talked about collective bargaining, about workers' consultations, cooperation, uh, all that idea of workers being involved, I think, will be less meaningful unless workers find a way to do this in collaboration with society. Nancy Fraser talks about a triple movement of workers impacted by change, of environmental activists aware of the need for the urgency of the change, but also of gender and the need to, in all of this, remember that we need to make a caring society. And unless you get those three big needs moving together to create the kind of society we want, that the level of momentum for politics to create a high energy democracy um, won't be there. So it's about how do you work across those different alliances? And that's, that's kind of what, what I wanted to, to build towards there. And I wanted to start that by, you know, you know that kind of um, Irish expression, well, how do you get somewhere? And they say, well, it wouldn't start from here kind of thing. So I wanted to, to look at what's our starting point in, our, in how we understand ourselves, because that's really, really important. And this is where Polanyi, I think, is really, really important. That in every system, you've got a state, you've got market and you've got society. And people generally get their welfare from some combination of state, market and society. They get from the state some redistribution, whatever it is, to public services, to income, to tax systems, to the market, they engage as producers and they consume, they, they buy products or whatever. But they also have a huge part of their welfare from society, from the reciprocal relations in the immediate family, in the wider kinships and in the community. And we saw that really well in the pandemic so far about how important society is. So I think our problem at the moment in not starting from here is that we have given the market and the private sector such a role in the provision of our livelihoods and our lives that the role of the state and society is under diminished and understood. So the type of knowledge that we're drawing in to understand what our potential alternatives are is very weak. I think in that same anthropological understanding, this doer receiver judge idea is that all people are doers, all people contribute something, but all people need something and need to be receivers. And all people are judges, they are policy actors, they have knowledge and they can create the kind of world that they're in. And that we need to really remember this, that when we're talking about, Niall talked about, you know, that the power of people to decide what we want machines to do and what we, want, what, what we don't want machines to do. And everybody has the capacity to make judgments about that, but we don't as a society have the power always to enact those judgments because we've given so much power to the market and to private algorithms to actually determine the, the delivery of resources. And I think that's really important in where does power need to be pulled back to give people the individual power? I mean, I'm minded not just a really simple idea. 89% of citizens say they do not like the automated telephone services in relation to delivery of social services. Would that stop it happening? Absolutely not. How can that knowledge be become a powerful thing for society to demand the type of services that they want. I think in relation to automation and digitization, 
one of the biggest problems, and Niall said this, is that we don't actually know. We really, really don't know as yet what kind of impact it's going to have on the nature of work. This is work done by Eurofund, looking at the impact of automation, digitalization, the possibilities generated by it, and the potential negativities generated from it, and the types of new jobs and new working arrangements that we can envisage coming out of it. Some of it really, really poor, but some of it quite exciting in some of the innovations that might allow the kind of four day weeks, the remote working, the kind of things that we're looking at some of the benefits of at the moment, as well as some of the negatives of. And I think that that's one of the real problems is that there are potential goods and bads and it's how do you harness the good while also mitigating out the bad. Um, this chart, just looking at the incidence of telework and ICT mobile work across Europe, I just think it's really interesting because it shows just the differences in different states across Europe and how that how it means it's really hard to get a handle on actually what's happening because what's happening is so different in each country. And often some of the big things that we talk about, I think, um, like the gig economy, for example, is not as advanced and not as developed as we think it is. I think it's only 3% of jobs are actually touched by it at the moment. So there is time and there is space to pull back some of this and to shape it the way we want it to be. Um, and as the, as the other chart there shows, there's positive and there's negative effects. And I'm not going to go into it that more, that that's, that's relatively well rehearsed. I suppose my question is, as workers and citizens facing into some of what will be inevitable and some of what won't be, is what kind of welfare architecture can help people negotiate and mediate the type of change that they're expecting, whether that's just transition climate related change or digital and automation change, and particularly when those two changes combine and come together, what kind of welfare state can help us do that? So just in terms of building on the knowledge that we have, I think Kate Raworth's work is really, really brilliant in giving us the answer to Sinead's question about where are we going and, and, and what kind of society are we trying to, to imagine we need. It tells us the sort of the safe and the just space for humanity that will really address our needs. And the question then, I think, for automation, for me, the biggest question about automation and digitalization is the one of power in terms of who determines what we will do. And the other is inequality, because we know from COVID tells us, and we saw it so explicitly, is that all of these things tend to reinforce the already existing fault lines and underlying conditions of inequality that are there. So we know that it's class primarily that determines the digital inequality. It's not age. I would have always thought, you know, young people are savvy, old people maybe less computer literate. But when you look at all the research shows you there is serious class digital exclusion out there. And that as we digitalize and as we automatize, this becomes the real issue about who will benefit from it and who will lose from it. So that issue of trying to address that inequality by education and training really deeply in the education system in primary and secondary in third level. It's not just we, you know, re-educating or reskilling workers that are there. It's really, really preparing people and citizens for what might exist. And we knew all that before the pandemic, but I think the pandemic has really, and every speaker has said this, has really forced us to think. Uh, it's really forced us to examine the role of work in our lives and made us aware of how work first our lives were. We've had a space where maybe we've been more life first orientated and as a, as a society, we're reflecting on that. And some of that is done through economic democracy, but, but a lot of it has been done through other types of democracy. And I think it's the fusion of those spaces, as I was saying, that idea of taking the gender space, the environmental space and the worker space and creating a high energy democracy. And I'd agree with John in that, that it's not all about social dialogue to identify the consensus that we want to move towards. Some of a high energy democracy is the energy of conflict the energy of dispute and protest that will also enable change and momentum to happen. So a democracy should have a mixture of conflicts and consensus, I think, in order to, to really vibrate, if you like, at the level of change that we need. Um, so COVID taught us a lot. Um, I think what COVID really showed us is the vulnerability we have to marketized nursing homes, marketized creches, uh, you know, like the level of the market determining what was possible was brought home to us very clearly, as well as 
inequality and the ecological crisis becoming more thing. But what COVID also showed us in, in, a, in a positive way, I think, is the malleability of social customs, how quickly we can change when we need to. And I'm very much in line with John, what John was saying there about showing us alternatives are possible and the role of the state becoming much more clear. It gave us glimmers of the alternative, I think, in terms of, now I was talking about the four day week, the social nature of money, how it actually is elastic if we want it to be, and um, how we can manage collective risks. And I think if we look at some of that, like in community and civil society, there was fantastic advances in telemedicine for abortion, for example. You know, like it, it really leaped and bounded some of what we thought might have been essential. But it also showed us the types of jobs that we can't make digital very easily. So that those essential jobs that really do meet human need, what we call the foundational economy, those workers who could not be put into remote working, who had to stay delivering us our food, delivering us our care, work in our shops, that service industry. Those are the jobs that we need to look at to make sure that they're, they're the human touch jobs, I think, that Niall was talking about, that we need to, to understand better. Um, it also showed us that the degree to which digitalization and automization is going to be a real issue in the delivery of public services. And how some of that was good, and how some of that will reinforce existing inequalities. I'm looking, for example, in my own research at the digitalization of public employment services. And what we're really nervous of here is what we're calling algorithmic power. So the power of an algorithm to determine who will get access to a public employment service and who won't. And there will not be a human uh, mediator in that space if certain systems have their way. And that will be the same in relation to the distribution of health services, of education. And that's what we need to be very careful about. And I've just heard something on WhatsApp, this is probably telling me enough. So we need to think about balance in a completely new way. What we have in the grey is a, a very market dominated state and society. That glimpse of the future, I think, the the, the early days of working about the new society we want has to redistribute roles, functions and power from the market back to the state and to society. And we need new ways of thinking about what solidarity means in that context. And I won't go into this now, but that anthropological nature of who we are and what we want and how we do live our lives as organic humans, that's really important knowledge that we're not bringing in enough. So I want to stop on this, the last slide, because it needs a new way of thinking about the welfare state, I think, because that has to be the underlying enabler that allows all of us to take risks if we lose our job, that there's something there that gives us some level of not just basic needs, but also the capacity to recreate our lives, the capacity to take those risks. So I think I know a lot of people have been talking about a basic income as a really important way of generating that. I'd like to think of a participation income because I want to encourage people to be the givers, to be the, the, the judges, to participate in democracy, to participate in society, in eco ecological care. So rather than a basic income, which guarantees income without any conditionality, I actually want to push people to create that society. So I think a participation income that's individual and that allows us to make more autonomous choices in how we balance work and care share care more equally before, between men and women, but also take our part as citizens in ecological action and political participation. So I think a participation income can do a lot with that, particularly if it's public, you know, combined with and underpinned by publicly funded universal basic services. And I think that's the new welfare architecture that we have to aim for. That needs a very facilitative state, a very big state, but a different way of thinking about the state than we have at the moment. And it also needs, of course, tax. And we need to think differently about tax at the moment to fund all that. But the important point about that diagram is that it's revolving around care. It's not revolving around growth. It's not revolving around GDP. It's not revolving, you know, it's a, it's, and it's care of ourselves as society and care of our economy and, uh, and our ecosystem that we live in. And that's where I think we need to be moving towards. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much for that, Mary. Um, just we won't keep you guys for long. We just have a couple of questions that I'll read out quickly for the panel. Um, the first couple of questions are to do with climate. So um, the first question is: Is just transition transition? Sorry, moving fast enough for the world to meet 2030 climate temperature goals? And is capitalism compatible with a just transition? Transition. Maybe I could go first. No and no. Um, <laughs> 
my own view is that, as I mentioned already, uh, a capitalist system is inherently unsustainable. We need to move to a post-growth system, one based more upon the vision that Mary eloquently outlined. And here's the reality of how slow we're, we're moving. To have a decent chance of keeping the global average temperature to 1.5 degree and therefore minimize inevitable climate breakdown. That's the reality, folks. Even if we were to stop burning carbon now, we're going to have to deal with some degree of climate breakdown. We have to reduce annually around 8 and 10 percent of greenhouse gas emissions a year. And that's a, a scale of um, if somebody's mic on, there's not a lot of feedback here. Um, but to me, we're not seeing that. The ambition isn't there, the leadership isn't there. And an issue that we that may be a crossover with the automation and the climate breakdown issue is, and I'm really worried about this, is the amount of undue uh, faith being put into technological solutions, you know, carbon capture and sequestration or solar radiation management, which really are science fiction, the aim of which is to sustain capitalism is to sustain our current system and not sustain a habitable planet. So I'll, I'll let, allow Sinead if she wants to come in and say something. Thanks very much, John. John's covered most of it there, but um, I suppose I should just say in, in ter there is this idea that um, it's kind of an old trope that, that seems very much by business, that uh, jobs versus the environment. Um, and and the, Tony Mazzocchi was actually a fantastic trade union leader in the US. He tried to start up a US uh, Labour Party and um, campaigning specifically on that. And uh, a big part of his campaign was the right to know in the nuclear industry. So uh, he he worked in the um, with Karen Silkwood, um, who was basically murdered by um, the nuclear industry because she tried to expose the, the chemicals that workers were being exposed to in the workplace. Uh, and for a long time, the nuclear industry has had pitched it as um, greeny, kind of hippie environmentalists against ordinary working people. Um, and that couldn't be further from the truth. And, and those reforms and, and that change that um, environmentalists and trade unions working together under Mazaki, under that kind of very workers' rights focused, uh, led to a much safer environment in the nuclear industry. Uh, and in Ireland, actually, it, it led to its complete removal from the island of the Ireland. Um, and that was mainly because of the trade union movement in Ireland. I'm sure there's people here in Forza that, that can speak to that. The, the ESB group of trade unions um, worked with public health experts and um, environmentalists uh, to ban the nuclear industry. Um, and the reality is that uh, th this isn't about um, I know that people say that just transition could delay action on climate, uh, but that isn't the reality. Um, trade law um, comes first before any climate action, just as it comes before any workers' rights action. And the issue is really trade law. Uh, we hear, see with the Mercosur agreement, we have CETA, um, TTIP, other agreements like that. They damage the environment and the and um, workers' rights together. And we're left fighting amongst ourselves. And um, I suppose um, often environmental issues, just like um, Margaret Thatcher was a good example, the Conservatives in Britain, when they were closing down coal mines, they often used environmental arguments. Uh, the fact that um, the Conservative Party at the time, uh, Roger Scruton actually has a very interesting book about this, that um, the Conservatives took on the role as, as climate heroes. Uh, but that was also a, a clever positioning and um, that meant that it was easier than to close down coal mines. And um, so I think environmentalists have to be very, very careful about the language that they use, that it's not actually serving. That the UK has achieved some of its climate goals a bit faster, but mainly because of offshoring of emissions and also because of offsets and because they switched to gas from coal and the infrastructure for that gas will last for the next 40 years. So. It, it's really, it's kind of greenwashing, really. So I think, uh, yeah, that's a very, very careful language that we have to be, that we have to watch for as trade unionists and also as environmentalists. Thanks for that, Sinead. Um, someone's put in the question, do you think we might see an organised violent response to a failure to properly tackle climate change? Well, I think, 
Uh, we've already seen this. I mean, this is the youth strike for climate. Uh, you know, Greta Thunberg, I mean, incredibly inspiring to think that young people who don't have a vote still have a voice and so on. Uh, Extinction Rebellion, um, other forms of non-violent direct action. We're, we're already seeing this. My big concern, and this is particularly in relation to the programme for government agreed with uh, uh, Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael and the Greens, is that the imposition of a carbon tax in particular, that's the, the, they're the only taxes we see in the programme for government. There isn't a, a, no, no change in corporation tax. Uh, we're going to see a plastics tax, probably a sugar tax and a carbon tax. And my real fear that as we come out of this really difficult recession that we're heading into as we cope with it, we could see a kind of gilet jaune type reaction where people, particularly in, in rural Ireland that I've already spoken about because there's a particular issue there, given the, the high concentration of our greenhouse gas profile in that sector, that if people are already seeing pain and uh, the negative impacts of a, of a transition to a low carbon economy, this could lead to the delegitimization of any attempt, that it's not improving their lives, it's only heaping costs upon them. They're not being included in terms of, say, citizens' assemblies on a regional level, come up with solutions and so on. So I could see a possibility both of nonviolent direct action uh, for climate action and potentially the opposite at the same time in a gilet jaune, hopefully. And I fully agree with what Mary has said that um, you know, democracy should be robust enough to include extra parliamentary, non-violent uh, direct action. But certainly, let's hope, and I speak now as somebody who's lived in the North here for a number of decades, we don't see anything approaching political motivated violence around this issue, uh, and that it, it does stay at the level of democratic, non-violent disagreement. Thanks, John. Um, we just have two final questions here uh, that are to do with automation. So I'll, I'll let Niall and Mary answer those, I think. The first one is, do you think there is a culture among leaders in developing automation to increase profit by reducing the number of workers? And the person's asking if the goal in some cases is to deliberate, deliberately reduce labor costs um, or is increase productivity the primary concern? And there is one final question. Do you see the marketplace growing and offering more choice similar to email and post or parcel services rather than reduction in work in a four day week? Uh, I'll take the first one, Mehak. Yeah. Um, just in relation to the, the question on is there a culture among leaders to reduce labor costs? I think th there's several different cultures overlapping each other when we talk about automation and particularly about artificial intelligence because what you have on the research side is a real hunger uh, for progress uh, as well as a hunger for data and ultimately they want to see where the machine learning uh, experiment takes them in each on their individual track of research and outside of that then you have a lot of commercial interests who uh, identify different types of developments in this technology and look at what the commercial applications are. And rather than thinking about reducing labor costs, I mean, in industry and in the commercial side, um, they're always looking at labor costs as uh, and how it reflects on the bottom line. But the 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 kind of tech startups that are that are using uh, this technology, who are then looking to sell it to to established uh, commercial interests, what they want to do is is accelerate this stuff as fast as they possibly can. And I attended a, an event on trustworthy AI back in February. I spoke at, at an event that, that gathered all of these type of people together. And it's really interesting. The academics are much more concerned with the ethics and the trustworthiness of AI. And the EU has only just begun to regulate for trustworthy AI and the Ursula van der Leyen announced um, the, the, the first round of uh, regulation around that in February. Um, but what the what the guys in the tech startups tend to want to do is to move this stuff as fast as possible and to use the Facebook uh, founding phrase to move fast and break things. And it's a bit like the development of the automobile. Um, when when cars were first manufactured, somebody had to stand in front of them waving a red flag to warn people there was a, 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 a an engine driven vehicle uh, on its way. And the motor industry eventually lobbied to to get rid of that. 
and there was no such thing as speed limits and more and more cars appeared on the road and eventually then regulation caught up with traffic signals traffic lights and and creating an infrastructure that accommodated this new technology and in a way artificial intelligence and automation are developing in the same way they want they want regulatory systems to get out of their way to see where the technology will take them and then you know maybe then regulation catches up and begins to control it so uh, it, it, the response to the question is there's no there's no overarching kind of agenda on reducing labor costs there's lots of overlapping agendas some of them moving very very quickly in a particular direction some of them concerned about ethics and trustworthiness some of them concerned about how it will affect uh, working people but not everybody is on the same page thanks mary would you like to add on to that I'm afraid you're muted there, Mary. Uh, the the eight richest men in the world are are all in in this automation business and and social media business, and they also overlapped a, a lot of, in relation to power in terms of their you know their their input into democracy is quite questionable in in a lot of things in terms of what they finance and what they own in terms of media, and um, so it is it's the nature of capitalism. Uh, being financialized capitalism and that that nucleus of of much more narrow power and um, that's driving a, lo a lot of this and i think that's the, the real problem that we need to try and understand that it's not just about individual company bosses deciding i'll do this to get this it's it's what's driving the whole machine towards something and um, that, that 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 we need to look at there's no such thing as slow profit anymore and the real danger with the automation and the digitalization is the drive is towards I want profit today, I want it now, and that that's what's driving a lot of the immediate decisions. And I think it relates to the second question in terms of the marketplace generating the, the new products and offering us these as, as choices that we will then take in our lives as consumers. And that's what's driving a lot of the innovation. If something else was driving the innovation, like high quality public services as the agenda, or as work-life balance as the real agenda, different products would be generated, I think, that would actually possibly lead to better quality of life. So I, I think as long as it's the market that's the driver. Um, now, having said that, we know from a, a lot of other research, like um, Mariana Mascuto, that the state is actually the enabler of a lot of what looks like market-driven generation, even the internet wouldn't have been developed without very significant levels of state investment into private sector innovation in research and blue skies development. So the state does have some role in determining some of where this, the investment in the innovation is happening and what the states, who is the ear of the state, who the state is doing it for and with is really important. So again, going back to that collective power, I think it's really important. But the question was, might we be busier than ever? And I think what we're doing right now is a really, really good example of that, isn't it? That if we don't control the use of these technologies and make the choices ourselves, yeah, we will be busier than ever. As Thanks so much for that, Mark. Yeah. I'm afraid that's all the time we have today. But I just want to say a thank you to everyone who joined us and a special thanks to all our panellists for their um, incredible contributions. Uh, have a lovely weekend and thanks again so much for joining us.